Good morning. So everything about this year is certainly different, isn't it? Amen, right. Um, I wanted to welcome everybody. I know that we have friends near and friends far, um, both virtually and in person. But most importantly, we're opening a series today regarding all of the unrest in our country, unrest in our state, unrest regionally, and unrest locally. And although this is going to be the beginning of a difficult conversation for all of us, I think it's one of importance. And I'm going to share with you one of my beginning conversations with Dr. Johnson, who we all know and love and we hold very dear and near to our hearts. So he's the perfect person to facilitate the beginning of this dialogue. As I watched Milton unfold and I understood the protesters, I really didn't understand the protesters. And the beginning conversation that I had with Dr. Johnson is how does a white female leader talk to those people of color and try and understand the plight that they're entering or they've been living their whole lives? And that began the start of where we're going to lead this series with all of you. I know that we have purposely set aside professional development opportunities to look at all different levels of underserved people, not just racism and social injustices, but we're discovering Title IX and the American Disabilities Act. And so I want to welcome back Dr. Johnson. He is really excited to lead and facilitate our journey through this year and going forward. And he invites all questions. And I hope that we can, deep in our hearts, listen to the messages that we're going to receive over the course of this year. Welcome to Monday, October 12th, and welcome Dr. Johnson. Well, thank you. So I'm so glad to be here with you all today. I'm honored that Dr. Keegan thought that I was special enough to be a part of this experience. Um, happy Indigenous Peoples Day. I know we're supposed to say Columbus Day, but I don't honor Christopher Columbus in the same way that y'all do. Uh, so, I say indigenous peoples because it's amazing to me, you know, science and history have both agreed. Columbus never made it here. And so 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. He sailed and sailed and sailed and sailed to find this land for me. And you remember that lie we've been telling you for a couple hundred years? So it's interesting that um, we celebrate Columbus as the founder of America. There are many in this country who would argue that his discovery, I mean, how do you discover a land where there's people already here? And the fact that those same people have been completely ignored for the last um, 500 years on and on. So I'm very excited to be here. This has been, good Lord, a hellacious year. So I want, to, I want everyone to know whether you're here or abroad or virtual, I appreciate teachers. And I thank you all for what you do on a daily basis. I thank you for what you have done so far in 2020. This academic year has promised to be um, special. It's definitely one for history books, right? So as Dr. Keegan said, this is uh, the beginning of a series. You all are gonna get so tired of me. I mean, I'm a great guy, but even I, even I tire of myself. So, but um, 
we're going somewhere together, which is the whole point. For us to go somewhere together. Um, and so this is meant to be um, a conversation, especially today. Um, I'm, I'm not going to be the big head sitting on the stage, um, although I'm sitting on a stage. But I want you to know that your questions matter to me. What's going on in your mind and in your heart matters to me. And I think that the more we engage, the more we talk together, the more we can learn together. Um, I have perspectives. I don't think mine are the right perspectives all the time. But I think with your wisdom and my wisdom, collectively, we can, we can do great things. So I want to open the floor because um, Dr. Keegan uh, wanted this to be, to talk about what is the impact on, uh, on all this stuff uh, related to race and racism from the white perspective. Well, guess what? I'm not white. Maybe y'all noticed that, maybe you didn't, because you know, supposedly we live in a colorblind society. Well, you know how that works. So I would like to hear from you and from you that are watching online. Um, what questions do you have? What's going on with, with you? What, what's confusing you in terms of what's going on in our world today besides COVID? Please. So, so I have an adopted son from Guatemala, and I hear all the talk about the talk. And he's not an opposing individual. He's only like not 100 pounds. He's not big. But I, I, I wonder, do I need to have that talk with him? Is that something I should be concerned about? Oh, is everybody familiar with the talk? So, and if, if, if I'm reading you correctly, the, the talk is, do you have a conversation with your child about race in America and what it might mean to be different? Is that the talk you're referring to? I'm thinking more of the lines of the, police, the policing and that aspect of the war. Okay. The racism. Okay. But I mean, it's all part of it. Yeah. So, the talk. My simple answer is yes. The, there's the, the more complicated parts of that are when, how old is he? He's in ninth grade, so he's 14. So yeah. So 14 is a, is a great time to begin having this conversation. Um, because I think, I think part of the dialogue has to be what has been your experiences thus far. How long has he been in the country? Okay, so he has history in this area. So what might it be like for him to be him in his body? Does he speak Spanish? No. Okay. So I think that part of this, what complicates this is this American ideal that everybody's equal, that everybody's, you treat everybody with respect. Let's, let's do a quick test. Raise your hand if you have been raised to believe that everybody's equal. That's almost everyone in the room. Chances are that even those of you that are, that are watching, I hope you raise your hand too. So, you know, if, here's my question. If everyone, and I do this, and I, I ask this question across the country, and by, by and large, I get the same responses. If everyone's t t raised to believe that everybody's equal and you treat everybody with respect. So I asked that question, you know, oh yeah, that's, my parents taught me this is their stuff. So then I ask, how do we get here? If 99% of the room, happen, and this happens everywhere I go, if 99% of the room responds, yes, I believe everyone is equal, then how do we get where we're at? Because there is a fundamental issue that we don't, that our aspirations, I'm sorry, do y'all teach with masks on? 
This is the one thing I, ha I have not gotten used to as a teacher. So doing this the entire class period is drives me nuts. So I got because I eat my mask. So I have one of these little inserts in here um, that I keep pulling away and I keep pulling it because it goes in my mouth. Um, so America has been we've been all been socialized to believe that everyone's equal. And everyone, it's all fair game. The problem with that is, and I agree, that's, that's what our aspirations are. We have not quite gotten there yet. So it's important for us to acknowledge that there are some issues in America, issues in Milton that we have got to address so that we can reach these lofty goals that we have, because we have not arrived yet. And so there are some people who don't get the same treatment everywhere they go. And so it's important to acknowledge that, that, that possibility, that he may have had some negative experiences related to race and his um, nationality that um, are clouding his living a full life. Um, so, so whether or not you have the talk with him and what is the extent of that talk um, relates to a lot of things because there are some regional things that are in that question. Uh, I've had the, the talk with my children. And although, so many of you know my children because I, I, they grew up here in Milton. Um, and so... I particularly had the talk with my son because I think that black males are potentially more targets than others. At least that's been the case as we look nationwide. Um, so I remember back in, I think it was 2014 or 2015, when Trayvon Martin was killed. Um, I was taking a di digital photography class at the time. And I remember taking a picture of my son with a hoodie on. And I was learning Photoshop at the time. So one of the, the things that I did, I, was, I, was, I played with, I took my, my son's picture and I put a swirl in his face. So I morphed his entire face. So it looked like a big, um, like a tornado. And I said, this is what George Zimmerman saw. He didn't see an individual. He saw an amalgam of every negative media stereotype, every um, ID, idea of what black men were. And if you listen to his 911 call, uh, when he, he, called, he called the police wanting them to intervene uh, because he, he saw a shady character. He saw a blob. And he wanted, he wanted um, the police to come and wanted them to come quickly because you know, his words were, you know, these guys, these guys always get away with it. And so his loaded language, you know, sort of shared the, the idea that this is a bad dude. So having the talk, I'm sorry this answer is so long. You get used to me. I'm, I'm a preacher, I'm a professor, and I talk slow. So get used to long answers. At least that's what, that's what I tell my students. So... The talk is a necessity, I think, given the fact that um, race and racism in America are an interesting place to be um, or a way to consider. So in a long story short, yes, have the talk. Um, but I would not characterize the police as the bad guy. 
I think it's important to say, hey, you know, to give the rules, you know, keep your hands still, you, you yes sir, no sir, whatever you do, um, and tell no sudden movements, understand that you got stopped probably for a reason. Um, and so if, if you're wondering what the, what the talk is like, I'm, I'm a movie guy, so let me give you a movie reference. Um, the Hey You Give, there is an awesome scene of a, a father having a talk with his children. Um, so, yes, have the talk. Another question. I'll try not to give it such a long answer. So, let me ask you a question then. Does it matter in the classroom? Does all this stuff that's happened, let me put it this way, when you watch all this stuff happen since the, the murder of George Floyd in May, have you, uh, and you watched the unrest happen, have you considered, or in what ways have you considered how this is going to impact your classroom? Okay, the question on the chat is, how does an educator find the balance between acknowledging cultural bias and programming more positive units and curriculum around building the whole individual in the sense that we start to think about teaching students of the world instead of teaching strictly to the students in front of us? That is a, a brilliant question, thank you. Um, I think the par part of it is not like the, the end of that question says, don't just see the people in front of you. These are people that are going to impact the world, right? So you should be talking to citizens of the world. Um, I, in all of my classes, find a way to shoehorn historical, historical learning in this. So one of the, thank you, one of the, Challenges to you as a teacher is to be thoughtful regarding you have you have pre homework to deciding what you're going to teach. So how do you how do you do your homework um, before you give the lesson? Um, I would say that it's important to. Um, Engage with the idea that um, you are teaching citizenship in all areas of your life, in all areas of your curriculum. So engaging with the idea that if I'm teaching about black history, that is all of our history. So it's black American history. A lot of what we've got in our schooling has left people out. And one of the challenges that um, you have before you is how do you bring people in? Um, and make sure that you, you are remembering to find a chance to give honor and find a chance to welcome di different voices and welcome different um, ways of knowing that the canon that, that you and I have been educated with is limited. Let me give you an example of the, of the limitations. I can give you a history of, of black Americans in five seconds. This is, this is the way we have taught them. Black people arrived here in chains. Abraham Lincoln set them free. Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King, Obama. That's, that's black history in, in America. That's basically what we've been taught. We've been taught a very limited way of seeing people. Um, and one of the, one of the most, um, the biggest downfalls that, that I would say to that is, and I hear this from students all the time, why have I never heard this before? Um, well, there's a reason we have not heard it before, because without, without giving them 
the real history without giving them the people's history. Um, that it's, it's, it's a very one-sided, uh, creates a very one-sided expectation. I often think of what, it's, what it must be like to be raised, socialized with the idea that my people were all slaves and brought here in chains. And so we wonder why when things go awry, why that's still happening. Thank you. So, I tr I, so this, this year, this semester, I've tr been trying several different things because I hate teaching with this mask. So I've tried several different amalgams of masks and shields and all kinds of stuff. But, so I wear the shield. I wore the shield once. But here's the problem. One is my head is too big. And then two, I don't feel safe with this. Because if, if, if this airborne thing, not to freak any of y'all out, but, you know, so what's protecting my chin and my face? So, so does the virus, like, hit the, this and stop there? I feel like this is still unprotected under here. So thank you, but I, I would need help fixing that. But nevertheless, so part of uh, engaging as a teacher with some of this stuff is really all about how do I challenge what I've been taught? How do I challenge the limitations that I have been educated with myself? Because we all, most of us, no matter your major, have been, been raised with the, or taught with the idea of the great books canon. So depending upon your discipline, you know, there, there are the founders, the fathers of your discipline. And we have been, we have been taught to believe that the, the beginning thoughts are those, those are the important people. And so we follow their traditions and their knowledge lines forever. And so it's hard to find disparate voices but it's not impossible. Um, my background is, is English. So I began my career as a high school English teacher. Um, and so when I was introduced to Alexander Pushkin, I was, a, I was in college. Anybody know who Alexander Pushkin is? Okay, Alexander Pushkin is the father of Russian literature. Not a big deal. So of course, as an English major, I had to read Pushkin. So I read it, okay, this is boring stuff. And I, and I really kind of pushed it away. And then somewhere I heard that his mother was African. So that, for me, as a black man going to a white school all of my life, I saw that as an opportunity. I saw it as a chance to see myself in his literature. So I went back to Pushkin and I, st I started searching for his mother in his writings. So just, and, and I, never, I never found her, quote unquote, um, but the thought that this, this black woman had influence upon him so therefore had influence on this idea of Russian literature. Gave me a new insight, gave me a new passion for what could, could have been. So I was able to find a new life, a new love for literature because I saw myself, or potentially saw myself, there. So don't, your, I think the question is right, don't just teach to the, the, to the students who are sitting in front of you. You're teaching to the world that's in front of you. Um, and be looking for opportunities to insert. It might not be two days worth of information. You might only find 
a blurb. Uh, verify the blurb and then see what you can, where it goes from there because you never know what, what it might do to the students that are in front of you. It might be the linchpin to their learning, the thing that makes them want to know more. And isn't that what we want? We want our students to, know, to question long enough to know more. The way we do history now, the way we do this kind of stuff now, it's pushed to the side. You know, we have, you know, we're in the, we're in the middle of Latino Heritage Month, which is the, the weirdest thing to me because it's September 15th to October 15th. So I'm like, why such a weird half month? Um, next month will be Native American Heritage Month and then Christmas Eve season. And then by February, it's Black History Month. So we have these, these torn out special days. And the word inclusion is a word because it's an opportunity for us as educators to include those who have been um, pushed aside and stepped on and stepped over and looked over, that there's an opportunity to include them in your regular classrooms. So that is an opportunity, I think. Now, it might mean you do an extra, extra bit of homework to get ready for that. Doesn't mean that you shouldn't, though. I mean, you give homework, right? Another question? The question is, over the last couple of years, I've experienced a situation within regular classroom management procedures where the student responded with, it's because I'm black, isn't it? I try to respond with something along the lines of, I'm addressing your choices, etc., but it doesn't feel like enough. What is a healthy response to that question? I think that is a healthy response. Um, I'm addressing your behavior, not you. It may, it may not, um, if the student is using it as an excuse to make you back off, if you back off, then they won. Um, not that it's a win-lose game. But that rationale comes from this idea that if I insert race at all, It'll scare you enough to just back you away. But I want you to know that um, the idea that, um, oh, it's because I'm black, it's because I'm whatever, um, is, a, is a, a learned defense mechanism um, with, the, with, the, with the hope of getting you off my back because it, because it makes white, white people nervous when I mention anything about race. So if I can make you nervous, I can get you off your game and you'll leave me alone. And then I can do what I want to do. So in, in short answer, keep doing what you're doing. I think that, I think that is a brilliant way of, of responding. Look, I don't know, how to know what to do with it. I'll give a short answer. <laughs> Another question? Nice to see you again. Likewise, Kathy, how are you? <laughs> um, so I'm a parent of a 10-year-old and 11-year-old. Um, and in our household, we do our best to expose our children to worldly events. Um, and part of that would be the, the protests throughout the country. Um, but I, I almost feel as if exposing our children to the protests um, could have a negative outcome because they're seeing, um, you know, this population of individuals uh, very angry and at times violent. Um, and so we have, we have actually restricted their viewing of, of news in, in many ways. So if you can provide some advice to a, a parent who, who wants to have open communication about all issues in the household, um, how, how do you how do you uh, justify, how do you explain the, um, the behavior of some individuals protesting when they're burning buildings and attacking people on the street? Um, I, I just, I don't know how to reconcile that with, I guess, myself and with, 
with them as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. No problem. The, I think the, there's a double-edged sword there because you do, you do want to expose them, but you also want to be careful as a parent um, to ensure that they're getting all sides of the story. I think the first conversation is why do you think they're protesting? Um, and what are they protesting? And so, um, I'll be honest with you, uh, the, the nationwide uh, call for, you know, for uh, activism that's caused by these national incidents is really different than when I was growing up. The idea that 24-hour um, cable news exists, um, so we never run out of stories. And then with, now that folks have camera phones everywhere, that we, we're constantly getting these um, stories or details of stories. Um, so I think that there's, there's a couple important things. Talk about why they're protesting in the first place. And so, you know, George Floyd, George Floyd's death was a um, catalyst in some way. So many people have seen the video. And so part of the difficulty is understanding, you know, and, you, and we hear it from multiple sides, different stories. We never hear the whole story. Um, I am not a fan of the residents of 1600 uh, Pennsylvania Avenue. But there's one thing that I can say, I'm sorry, and I hope that doesn't ruin, ruin my credibility with any of you. Um, but there's one thing, that there's a term that he introduced um, in his 2016 election that has changed America. That term is fake news. There is a whole lot of fake news in the world. I will agree with him on that. Um, but part of that fake news is we, we've got too many perspectives. We get, we're getting too many news outlets. And so we never know who's reporting the right story. And so, I mean, just as if you look at the protests themselves. So the second thing I would tell you that you, you're right to, to address the looting and the rioting and all that kind of stuff. But I, I would say also to address that in the context that it's not just those who are protesting. Um, a lot of the peaceful protests that have, that they have started, well, protests that have started peaceful had become melees, not by the people who started the peaceful pro protests. So there have been, um, well, I won't sugarcoat it. So there have been white individuals who have started those many of those rights. Um, so all it takes is to, is when you're, when you're amped up, when you're angry, and you're wanting to see action, it only takes one person to break a window, and all hell breaks loose. And I think, because the power of groupthink, um, if you have not sort of put it in your head that I'm not going to act unseemly, um, if you have not uh, sort of stayed in yourself that I'm angry, yes, but I'm not going to break laws or, break, or kill people or whatever, um, then it's easy to fall in line with what's going on. So, so I think you're right to be a parent. Um, introduce the, the real reason, the underlying reason. The, and this is one thing I would say to white people, uh, especially, um, this idea of George Floyd's murder by a police officer um, is part of a pattern. This is not an individual, just an ind individual act. The, this one bad guy did a bad thing. And so what's caused, I'm sorry, let me take this out because it's going in my mouth and it's driving me nuts. What has caused a lot of the difficulty 
is the fact that we see these things over and over and over and over. And it's people who are agents of state. People who are supposed to be taking care of me. Um, who, uh, who seem to be able to uh, arrest, detain, and uh, safely take in white persons who are accused of crime. But uh, my people somehow end up dead. I never quite understood that. Um, Dylan Roof, the shooter of uh, Charleston, uh, the church in Charleston, South Carolina. The police took him to Burger King because he was hungry after he had shot and killed nine people. But George Floyd ends up under somebody's knee for nine minutes. That, that just makes no sense to me. And it's not an individual act. It's, it's a system that um, minimizes, a system that denies the fundamental rights to a group of people. Now, Vice President Mike Pence has argued in the, in the 2016 election, and he just said it last week in the debate with Kamala Harris, talking about systemic implicit bias. I think Vice President Pence um, thinks that there's no such thing as implicit bias, but we are all biased people, every single one of us. Um, and I like to, I like to pretend when I walk into a classroom that, that my biases lay, stay at the door. That would not be true. Um, but I try to teach bias free. But I am a product of my upbringing. I'm a product of the media I've consumed. I'm a product of the religious institutions that I have attended. Uh, and so what they have all taught me stays in the back of my mind. And it does not make me a bad person if that, those things eventually come out. But what makes me a bad person is not the thought, it's the action. What, I, what do I do with the information that's inside of me? I don't have to believe it, but it, sometimes it just shows up. Does anybody else have this experience where you're talking and all of a sudden your mother comes out? <laughs> I'm like, what are you doing here? Oh, you brought me here. So occasionally that stuff just comes out. And it's not, it doesn't make you a bad person. It just means you are a product of, what's, of your upbringing. So it comes out. You don't want it to be there, but it's there. So, Kathy, I would say, keep being a parent. Keep um, uh, them understanding the underside, the under, under all this, not just the mediated response. Because media only gives part of the story. Um, encourage them to ask questions, even ask questions of you. Um, why is this happening? Um, when, you're, when you are consistently denied a, a heritage, denied a personhood, then these, then these things happen. Uh, but understand it's not just uh, what we see. That's the truth. Is there another question? As a new science teacher, I try to meet my students where they are. I pre-assess them and help to provide a variety of life experiences to help make my content, physics, more real. I understand I come with my own implicit bias and try to teach the world contribution to math and how it feels into physics, or excuse me, how it feeds into physics and the mathematical work we do, but don't really cover much past the work being done in the Enlightenment. Outside of a flash forward to more modern topics, what would be some ways to bring a more global perspective? Um, this is one of those homework areas. I saw a book some years ago, I can't remember the title of it, but there, it's, um, it was the idea of how Afrocentric the study of math and physics were. Um, so do, do some pre-work, some, some um, what I call preflection. So this idea that if I see this history, how does that make me feel? And how does it make me feel to have been denied that? 
And then we, where do we go from there? I think there, I wish I, wish I I'm sorry, my recall is not the way it used to be. Um, I think this is a question that I got a lot when I was at, at the university, because I, I would have science faculty in particular who would say, well, I teach, I teach science. What does, this, what does this diversity stuff have to do with what I teach? It's not just about content. Content is just one piece of it. But it's your, it's your, it's your pedagogy, it's your, it's your methodology with regard to how do we you know, do this diversity thing. Uh, so I would look for opportunities to have um, your students working together. Uh, I would look for opportunities to have them learning with and from each other uh, as a way of engaging this topic of difference. I mean, uh, speaking specifically to the science curriculum, I can't really, because I'm not a scientist, and I, I just don't know of, the, of the, the techniques that would work in terms of the global idea. Uh, but, but it's not just content, is, is what, I, what I'm trying to underscore there. To look for opportunities to engage different ways. So, so I would also argue, no matter what we're talking about, um, white people, be white. I need you to be white. And I want you to, so this is, this is gonna sound really weird coming from a black person. I need you to be white and it's okay to be white. And so the reason why I say that because we get uncomfortable talking about race writ large. Um, so the more you engage with the, the idea that you have a race, white, white people, uh, the more likely you are able to uh, engage from a literate level. Because a lot of people don't like to have conversations about difference, particularly race. Part is because they, they feel one of the Number one things I hear, I'm afraid to say the wrong thing. Is that, is that real for anybody else in here? I'm afraid to say the wrong thing? I've seen a couple head nods. Well, here's, what, here's my solution to that. Don't. Don't say the wrong thing. Now, what I, what I suggest is thinking before you speak. What are the possible ramifications of what I'm going to say here. If I say this as I'm thinking it, what, how might this be received by, by the people who are in front of me? Um, and then decide, if I still want to say what I'm, what I'm going to say, what's the best way to say it? Is there a way that's not going to cause people to flip out? Um, I'll say it this way. When I first moved to this region, I was the director of multicultural, multi, multicultural affairs, the director of diversity at Susquehanna University. This is what brought me to this region. Uh, first day on the job, I'm, going, I'm, I'm dressed in a suit, I'm looking good. Man, I was fly that day. Um, and I went to the cafeteria to get my lunch. I walked through the cafeteria, got my food and went to pay for my meal. The lovely cashier, she spoke to me and she had the cutest little southern accent. She said, Ma, you dress nice for a colored man. You hear that grunt? You hear that collective sigh? That I heard that amplified in my head a hundred times. And so, so I wanted to say something. I wanted to tell her how that bothered me deeply. And so here was my response to her, because I, I, had, I had to think, if I go off, it's my first day on the job, I don't know how long she's been here, but if I go off, guess who's gonna, go, gonna get fired? So my answer was this, ma'am, the term colored offends me. I identify as black. Would you please identify me that way in the future, in future conversations? 
Now, I was on that job for seven years. Five days a week, I encountered that lady um, every day. Five days a week for seven years. She never once called me colored again. Um, I don't know. Here's what I don't know. I don't know that she went home and called all her family together for a family meeting and said, listen, y'all, they ain't colored no more. They black. I don't know if she had that conversation. But I do know that with me, she never used the term that I did not like again. Now, having, having lived in this region for a, a minute now, this was 2001 when I came here, because the term color um, sets me back a few decades. Uh, so I learned, though, that that's the lingo of this region. Like, I, that was not the only time I got called color. So I had to learn that that's the lingua franca of this region. And the more I understood this region, the more I understood why she called me that. She was not trying to be offensive. Um, she was trying to uh, compliment me, if that was a compliment. I don't know why my race had anything to do with, with what I was wearing. She could have just, she could have just said, my, you look nice. And I said, well, thank you. But why my race had to be brought into that, I have no idea. Uh, but nevertheless, but, but he, I, the point of telling you that story was this. Now, a lot of people are nervous around, get nervous around racial conversation. Because they expect, if I say the wrong thing, if I do something that is um, off-putting in some way, then I'm going to label an ist. A racist, sexist, heterosexist bigot. If I do, do or say the wrong thing, somebody's going to call me a bigot of some type. But I'm not a bigot. And that's part of the issue here. Most people are not worried about offending. They're more worried about somebody calling them on their stuff. Um, most of us have been brought up with the idea that I'm one of the good ones. I, so the way we see racism in America, we can point to the men in the white hoods. I'm not, a, I'm not, one, of those, I'm not one of those members, so I'm, I'm, a, I'm a good one. So I'm, so I'm safe. And so if you call me a racist, then, then in my mind, I'm one of the guys in the hoods over there. It's them that are the problem. But rather than to see the individual implicit bias, if I can see that I have a way of colorizing situations that make it negative. Uh, for instance, when we, when we engage with the, the affirmative action debate, um, do you know who the number one beneficiaries of affirmative action programs in the United States are? Anybody want to take a guess? White women. <gasps> really? Well, yeah. But the way, the way we, we talk about it, though, when we talk about affirmative action in, in America, it's those brown people who are coming to take my stuff. They're taking my job. They're taking my whatever. Number two beneficiary, white men. The ERA, the Montgomery, the, the GI Bill, all affirmative action programs designed to provide opportunities for those who it might have missed and might be denied. So those are for affirmative action programs, but, the, but we have, the way we affirmative action, do affirmative action today, it's those brown people who are taking my stuff. So how did I get there? What question was I answering? How would you really answer questions? Oh, I'm rambling. <laughs> okay, I'll finish. I'll finish that statement with: um, We're all, we're all, um, we all have things that are floating around in the back of our heads that cause us to question the veracity of certain things. And so, yeah, now I'm running again because I'm trying to find my I'm trying to find my point. And it's just gone. So I'll stop. Is there another question? Brian, you and I talked about when we looked at our data 
in the last five years, we only have recorded seven instances of racism in the Milton Area School District. And we discussed why we thought that was possible um, and how it was possible. You know, it was specifically after the protest in Warrior Run and then again in Milton and how our data is so low and how we are so unaware of racism existing in our schools. And we started to brainstorm some potential solutions on how to begin addressing and opening our school culture that people feel safe coming forward and talking about how they've been discriminated against. And again, I, you know, we talked about not only racism, but we talked about um, homelessness, we talked about disability, and what are some efforts we could put into place to help address some of that quietness that's occurring because of the fear of coming forward. I don't know if you want to talk a little bit to this group in regards to uh, the advocacy efforts, the ability to be quiet and listen, and to help address some of this unspoken occurrences that are happening. Yeah, um, I'm happy to. The idea that um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm totally not surprised that there are less reported cases than there are um, in reality. Because it's, it's the same as the issue of rape. It's not, well, I don't want to, to falsely equate it's the same, it's not. Um, but a lot of rape cases don't go unreported, not here, just in, in, in general, because of the way we treat victims. Um, and if I don't uh, trust the system, I'm less likely to go to the system and say, hey, this is happening to me. So a lot of what we're talking, the answer that, that I share with Dr. Keegan is when once we when when we when we make this this whole thing beyond aspiration, this whole idea of being a more inclusive community and creating a community that cares, um, the more the more we make that genuine, the more likely you are to have people responding to our, you know, because a lot of a lot of things, for instance, a, a lot of the crying outside of here. Um, when people raise issues, your hands as, as, a, as a school are tied in a lot of ways. So that, because one of the things that, for instance, I heard a lot about in recent years is the subject of bullying. I know this is a topic that you all have talked about incessantly at this school. Here's the issue, though. If I report that I've been bullied, and I raise a, raise a red flag. I bring it to you. Your hands are officially tied from that point. And so you can't say anything until there is some resolution. You can't even say you're working on this, or you can say that we're addressing it. But that's, that's as far as you can go. And so what it looks like to me on the outside is that nobody's doing anything. Nobody cares. And so then if... If people who know me know, and know this happened to me don't see the school district doing something about my case, they're, they're going to interpret, there's the potential for them to interpret, the school is doing nothing and they don't care. So that breeds this distrust. And so what happens then, sorry, I'm going to put this back in because now I'm eating my mask. I give all the respect in the world to teachers today. So the, what people come in with, the baggage they're carrying, uh, it has to be really bad for people to, for some people to really um, trust the system enough that they're going to voice a concern. They also, in voicing the concern, they're also saying that I recognize that you have you want to do something about this. Because here's the thing, all the signs in the world are nice, 
You know, you can put, I, I've seen your respect signs and your Panther pride signs. Those are great, but it's just a sign. Let's make the signs real. Uh, I'll give you a case in point. My daughter, when she was attending this school, came home one day in tears. She was flipping mad. And because she was sitting on the playground, I think she was outside reading a book. And one of her, one of her fellow peers came to her and said, I didn't know you, you people read. Because she, she, she loved to read. But the, her friend, her peer, said she couldn't believe, he couldn't believe that she was reading. Because she didn't know our, our people, her people, read. And that was, to her, very painful. And I wanted to raise the issue with the school. But I decided to handle it in-house. So I tried to build her up and give her a parent's perspective on what the, about how this was considered. So as to ameliorate potential hoopla. Uh, when my son started school, for instance, in this area, they were, um, he was in kindergarten at um, Washington Christian School, Washington, Washington Christian Academy. And I remember this and I um, was grateful for it. So I, it was uh, around the time of Martin Luther King Day. And so Alvin came home in, you know, crying one day. Oh, I'm sorry, no. Yeah, he said that the teacher had been talking about the uh, Montgomery bus, bus, bus boycott. And she, had, she was explaining that many of the white people would not sit near the black people. And so she was surprised by the fact that Auburn had, um, had that experience, that the kids in the school at lunch that day would not sit with him, would not sit near him. Because from a kid's perspective, you know, they were just doing what the, what the lesson taught them. So rather than making it a school issue, again, I talked to him. And so I imagine this is what's going on here. That there are things that are going on that, that people decide to handle in, in the house rather than bring it and make an issue for the school. Um, and so I, I told Alvin that I gave him the, the talk. We had more than one talk. Um, and so I wanted him to understand that there are people in this world who, who mistreat people like him for no other reason than they're just like him. And I said, this, this will happen, and um, if it happens again, let me know. So and then I had a conversation with the teacher because I understood where she was coming from as a teacher, and she's doing the things that we're here to talk about today, and that, that level of, of inclusion that I wanted, to, I, wanted, I wanted them to be doing but I didn't want her to be doing it at the expense of my son. So she and I had a conversation. And I said, um, let me have the conversation with your suits. I would love to come in and just sit down with them and help them to understand this stuff. If you want to do these types of conversations again. Because I need you to understand what it's like to be the only black student in the entire school. I would just be completely flabbergasted. My son's in kindergarten, and, we, and I would walk him to his classroom in the morning. And the school at the time was K-8, so kindergarten through eighth grade. I'm walking down the, the hallway, and, and, and older kids, like eighth and seventh, seventh, seventh eighth grade, oh, man, and they're slapping high five. I'm like, who are these people talking to my kid? And so I thought it was really cool that he was so popular. But I also had to figure out why. His popularity, I think, in some ways relate, was related to his exoticism. And so it was for, for an eighth grader to be friends or to be cool with a kindergartner was amazing to me. But I think it was because he was the only black and brown kid there. Um, so, so the conversation I had with the teacher was there are some, some, some things that happen because he is the only one. 
Um, and he doesn't have a safe space to just be. Uh, and and then in some ways, that is related to being an oddball. And those of you that know Auburn know Auburn's an oddball. I mean, he should be because I am. Um, the idea of what I want, that was a long answer. So, yes. So, the more you open up these cans of worms, they're great, but they do have potential downsides. Um, it's like the, the president said recently, if we didn't test so much, we wouldn't know, there was, we, we wouldn't have more cases. Well, yeah, if we didn't bring up this stuff about race and racism, then we would never know. But we need to have a, a, a real picture of what it's like in this region. Is, is, racism, is, is, racism, is, is racism in Milton? Yes. And if you say no, then you're a liar. And if you say, if you're a liar, then whatever. Um, but it's very difficult to separate racism from America. And I mean, it's a part of who we are. We, you know, people love to say this, this country was founded upon the principles of freedom. We have never had true freedom in this country, if we're honest. At least freedom for all, that has not been real. Um, and so there is potential to open up doors for um, some unhappiness by revealing truth, but it's necessary truth. Any other questions? Any other questions from those that are here? Any other questions in the chat? So we have led off today with a conversation, um, a difficult conversation perhaps for some of us to hear. I really appreciated the richness of the, the questions that we received through the chat um, because our work going forward today is involving content and lesson planning and it means that our faculty is starting to think about how to open some cultural doors as they do their unit plans and consider what they're teaching the rest of the year. One of the other areas that Dr. Johnson and I did talk about, and I'd like this faculty to consider, is advocacy and how to learn to be good listeners and offer support and serve as liaisons. And I'm sorry, Brian, but the name is escaping me. There was a term that you used to create a cadre of people within the district that students feel comfortable going to and talking to. Um, so we are solutions driven, but we are willing to have difficult conversation. Um, I know that Dr. Johnson was looking forward to this day, and I hope that we continue to move forward in a positive way to start really examining our inclusivity. And is it a word we use or is it a practice that we implement? So thank you, Dr. Johnson. We're gonna close this session, but are there any more questions before we close? I think that term was diversity champion. Diversity champion, you're correct. So if you're interested in being a diversity champion, please reach out to me or to any administrator. Um, we are gonna move forward with implementing diversity champions. But we do know that we have some work to do to get to that point. Understand this, it does not mean that you know it all. It just means you are willing to hear and willing to listen uh, and willing to sort of open your arms and your heart to a uh, different voice. So that, that does not mean that you have to agree with everything. It just means that people, under, the, the students understand that this is a person that is a resource to me. That if I have this concern in my heart, I can go to Mrs. Adeline um, or go to Dr. So-and-so. Um, my kids, it's so funny, like they, um, to this day, 
Um, and my kids have been out of school now, out of the out of Milton School District for a number of years. And Lisa just graduated from college this year. Um, you want to feel old. But they, they talk about Mr. Kong all the time. Because um, he's a person that they look to, look at as a person they could have gone to. Um, and so there are others. Uh, Mrs. Finnerty. Annalisa loved Mrs. Finnerty. So, so by, calling, by being called a diversity champion does not mean that you know it all. But it just means somebody that I can go to if I have a concern about an issue. Is somebody that you're, you're knowledgeable about an issue uh, or knowledgeable about potential solutions or knowledgeable about uh, or have a caring heart. It's an opportunity for you to be recognized for being you. So don't let the, the title scare you away because it's really just this is somebody that's you're being called out and so and being a sort of a resource person that people can go to and who have concerns about stuff. Okay, thank you again.